Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Anna, and I work on research and policy at the Web Foundation. Uh, so the Web Foundation was founded in 2009 uh, by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and uh, we work to fight for uh, digital equality and an open web. So open data, where do we go from here? Uh, so we know the movement is 10 years old, and uh, where are we and where are we going? So first of all, why open data? Well, it really should be about data that is for everyone. It's a right for all. Uh, the data people need, and it should really be the data people can easily use. Uh, and in the context of uh, the open data barometer, uh, which we work on in assessing open government data around the world, uh, currently at 115 countries, uh, we really look at readiness in terms of policy and implementation in terms of uh, key sectors, uh, 15 of them, uh, and, and data sets and, and how open they really are, and the impact that uh, we are achieving with open data or lack thereof. So just to start with the region, um, over the last four editions, uh, we've kind of seen a stalling and a backsliding uh, throughout uh, the region within the rankings going down, uh, with the exception of Norway. That's been kind of going up and down a, on a roller coaster in terms of uh, ranks. Uh, they're still number 10 uh, out of 115 countries. But we can see in general there's just been uh, a lack of uh, commitments around open government data initiatives, uh, open data policies and strategies uh, in Nordic countries at the federal level. So what happened, um, especially in Sweden, there is a very strong like, right to information, access to information component to a, a legal framework that has been around forever. I mean, it's the oldest in the world. Uh, so, so why not have more open data and have more available uh, data? So I'm going to zoom in on, on Sweden because we are in Stockholm. Uh, and just to look at uh, the progress that has been uh, made over the last uh, four editions in our work. Uh, so we can kind of see that um, there has been a stalling in um, open government data initiatives. Uh, we've also introduced uh, policy and strategy assessments as well as uh, data management um, in, in, in our own methodology. So that has kind of shifted. So don't, don't be uh, alarmed by not having that in the second and first edition. But basically, we can just kind of see that nothing has really been moving forward. The scoring hasn't increased. And uh, si same goes for implementation, which is really looking at key data sets across these 15 sectors that are available on uh, the right-hand side. So um, here we can really see that uh, one of the most critical uh, data sets uh, for uh, transparency, accountability, but also to eliminate um, even perceptions of corruption uh, in spending company and the contracting data are still largely closed. So it's really important to think like why, why is this still the case and how can we make a difference? So you can kind of see this better uh, if you do go uh, on our website at opendatabarometer.org, and you can kind of investigate the different levels of openness that we're looking at uh, in terms of seeing what's open or what's not with the green and the red dots, uh, and, and see at the, the, the limitations for, for some of the data sets I just uh, mentioned. And the impact evolution, largely because a lot of the data sets are also closed, um, is low. So uh, th the impact hasn't really made it there quite yet because we just cannot do anything with uh, the data sets that's, that are closed uh, in terms of openness. So entrepreneurs or startups or civil society organizations cannot take that data, make analysis with it, and understand uh, what needs to be done, what changes need to happen to uh, increase openness in, in society. But so that's the Nordic problem and the Swedish problem, but really it's a global problem. Uh, we do have a long way to go, because if we kind of look at the state of open data uh, worldwide, we, we really do see that most government data is still not open. It's not really the data people need. It's not being used to improve their lives. And the government data that is out there, it's large, a lot of the times it's hard to use, and uh, so people don't engage with it with more than a one-time thing because they just don't have a, the opportunity to really do anything with it. Uh, and again, looking across budget, company registries, spending, contracting, and land ownership, 
again, that those are global percentages across 115 countries of actual openness. So 90% of government data sets are not open. It's, the data usually is incomplete and it's of low quality. Um, we've realized in the last barometer edition uh, that we've launched in May that, again, sustained political will is really important and it makes or breaks it success at, of open government data and moving that commitment of openness from one administration to the next, one government to the next is really important to keep it going and, and make it sustainable. Um, and then we, we've also kind of noticed that governments are not opening the data needed to restore citizen trust. And last but not least, few open data initiatives really focus on promoting inclusion and equity. So having uh, gender responsive policies uh, in, in, their, in their open frameworks. So what we do recommend uh, with a barometer in the Web Foundation is looking at um, open by default. And again, this isn't necessarily to get governments to open up everything on them, but it's the data that should be publicly available should be made open. Uh, we are taxpayers, taxpayers' money are used to uh, collect this data, so we should have the right to have access to it and use it. Um, it's also about decentralization. So uh, here we're, we notice that central open data portals play a really key role, but we really think it's also important that each government department should have an open data component to their website and to their data to make it available to access in multiple places, not just one open data portal that is run by one department and one agency. And third, um, the co countries should adopt the open data charter on, as a policy framework, and this was discussed uh, yesterday in a conference. Um, and it would be a good thing to kind of bring everybody on board to uh, embed practices and share best uh, practices as well in terms of uh, bringing it, the open government policies in a strategic way to drive uh, openness forward. And it should really be about consulting citizens and intermediaries. So any entrepreneurs, startups working in the space, but also just civil society organizations and groups uh, in open data, but outside of it as well, should be involved in the process. And this would definitely help with point number five, which is to invest in data to improve the lives of marginalized groups, because often grassroots organizations work with uh, excluded groups. So that would really help as well. So the open data charter are, is all about all aspects of the open data uh, spectrum, right? Open by default, timely and comprehensive. It's about being data that's accessible and usable, comparable and interoperable. And these last two points are really important for sustainability and implementation of open data throughout time. So looking at improved governance and citizen engagement ongoing, not just at the beginning of an open data doctrine, but throughout time, and then also for inclusive development and innovation. So these are its principles, um, and then it, they could be adopted at both at a national and subnational level. So having a common framework to discuss this is important. Also bringing it down to subnational level uh, adds to this component. And it's really about supporting government implementing open data projects uh, also across different sectors, because we largely see one open data initiative uh, taking place in the pre office of the presidency, but the agriculture ministry doesn't really know what's happening. So how do you do more collaborative efforts within governments and outside of governments and uh, increase internal communication along with external communication? And then also bringing this back to the international level at um, global conferences like the International Open Data Conference or the Open Government Partnership Summit. Uh, another thing you can do is join me. Um, I'm co-chairing the Open Data Charters Measurement and Accountability Working Group. So we're looking, we're working with uh, Open Knowledge International, but others as well, in understanding what we've measured so far, uh, where where are we going, what what can be really assessed and what cannot. Um, we're building this assessment guide by looking at a practical implementation of both. Um, open data measurements and, and indicators that make sense, but seeing what cannot be measured, where the gaps are, and what other initiatives can then come from that uh, to, to fill in those gaps. And then also seeing how we can improve our own methodologies of measuring open government data and, and do a better job.
so speaking about openness, um, we do keep an open process uh, with the barometer. So all of our raw data is available to download. Our methodology and our research handbook is all there online uh, for anybody to look at and ask questions. Uh, just to, to, to make sure we, we do kind of keep uh, cham practice what we preach. So what's new? Well, AI, so artificial intelligence is a new thing. So what can you do with open data and AI? Well, uh, with open government and AI, there are, there's a great opportunity, but we're really not there yet with uh, the quality of the data sets that exist, but also to make sure that it's the data sets that uh, that our quality that is also what the people want so um, this is something that we can use as an opportunity to collaborate on on uh, crossing over to AI with open data but we must make sure that the data is the one that we really need and it's quality to, to actually move that forward uh, but we cannot really forget that this is back to access to information right so it's about a fundamental human right it's the basis for state citizen interactions. It's really about the governance and participation and collaborative efforts, right? It's also a process. Open data is a tool, it's an idea, but it's about working together. And, and working together really does also show a measure of democracy. And so it's really about a building block of the open space that we're a part of. And I thought I'd be the only one showing you a slide on on papers and documents, but, but apparently not. So uh, this is uh, me taking this photo in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire in a procurement office. And this is largely still the problem, like digitization is a problem in uh, West Africa, but it's also the problem uh, here. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do uh, beyond, before we move to AI and, and in new technologies and blockchain, like how do we make sure that this is captured online first and uh, it's accessible and useful information for our citizens. And that's why communications mediums matter. And this is online and offline, and I really advocate for both. So to really close the digital gender gap, we do have to react. So one of the projects we work on is women's rights online, and we really look at five components. We look at rights, we look at education, access, content, and targets. And, and targets is really about engaging with policymakers, working with women's groups, but also digital rights groups uh, outside the open data space in the accessible internet space and ICT forums uh, to bring that all together to make it a uh, more inclusive internet and also more inclusive open data, as I would say. So this is why it's important to, to work with different players uh, and, and stakeholder groups. Um, here we have, um, IDEA from Jogjakarta, which is a, a, a city in Indonesia. So they're an NGO. They work with our lab in the Open Data Lab in Jakarta and with the uh, subnational government to uh, open up the budget for women's development that started three years ago. So they do that work by building a portal and making it online, but then they also take it offline to the communities. Uh, through these newspapers and comics in Bahasa. So not only having English, having different uh, languages involved, making it more inclusive in the process, seeing how what has changed over time, where that money is allocated and to whom. So it's really important to show open data in different ways and be creative with the way uh, we address that so uh, the right people get access to it. And then again, it's not just about looking at budget and uh, gender data in, in a silo in its own space, right? So I'm looking at how all of these data sets that we kind of analyze in the open data barometer, how are those linked to sustainable development goals and achieving those, but not only that, is how do we make sure that uh, women can use public procurement and contracting data that already exists to empower themselves? So it doesn't, uh, gender disaggregation and data disaggregation is important to have more context and more an analysis, but it's important for uh, groups to be able to see if they're being discriminated upon about in terms of who are the business owners, uh, are they men or women, do they get more bids, uh, do they win more contracts, what kind of gender responsive policies need to change in, in uh, public procurement or in even in the act and the legislation of the country to make it more inclusive. So those are the kinds of um, uh, 
problems you can address uh, with data for groups as well. So that's why we can't forget that uh, as much as uh, open data is about innovation, it's also about social change. And, and social change is more than just counting data sets. We should really move beyond the data about and for people uh, and really promote data with and by people. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, anybody have any questions for Anna? Otherwise, I have a burning question. Okay, I'll just rush to ask you then. Um, Anna, it seems that um, the Nordic countries are really sliding back in, in the rankings. We must have hit some kind of plateau, or is it because other countries are really picking up speed now? I don't know exactly how you, you work out the rankings. And, and the second question, if we are indeed sliding back, what do, you, what do you think we can do about it? Um, I mean, what's the reason why the Nordics are, are sliding back? That's an excellent question. So um, I think uh, champ champions or leaders in general in open data have kind of stagnated, and we've seen that. I mean, besides seeing the UK as a you know, strong number one throughout the editions, and then in Canada coming on, and France as well, uh, there has been a backsliding problem in, in general. So I would say that uh, looking at uh, policy components and engaging government officials working with open data, adopting the open data charter, uh, seeing what's being done in other areas and, and other regions to maybe get, draw some inspiration from the work that's being there. And then also uh, having more citizen consultations and forums, webinars to kind of understand what citizens want, what kind of, if this data is useful or not, and, and having more of um, and engagement processes and capacity building to really understand why there has been a stagnation. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just more participatory efforts from the government should be made to understand. Uh, right, okay. Yeah, because you talk very much about um, citizens, that um, open data is is to serve the citizens, and, and like you said, it should be done with and by citizens and not just uh, towards citizens. So right. that's really what, what you're uh, um, sort of recommending that, that we do, that we involve citizens more directly rather than do something for them or... So it's important for governments to have those conversations mm -hmm. internally and to, uh, to decide of, on a strategy and how to build that, but then they also have to take that conversation out and, and engage different groups to, to be open, right, and transparent uh, and sort of take some responsibility around commitments that are made. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Later on, uh, Anna will return because then we'll have uh, a small debate here between Anna and our next speaker, Antti. And I think it's going to be really interesting because you're talking, you have experience from the whole world. I mean, you know how it's going across the world. And now we're going to hear from, from um, Antti, who's actually going to, to present things also in a citizen's perspective, but from a very sort of personal point of view from each individual citizen. So um, I'm looking forward to, to see you back here. Thank you very much. Should we just give Anna a hand?